Good evening. Thanks for joining us. My name is um, Edna Becerra. I'm the Executive Director of Enrollment Management and Marketing here at Whittier College, and I'm joined by two of our esteemed professors in psychology who have um, agreed to lead this, this info session on the psychology department here at Whittier College and the majors and minors that they offer. I'll start. Um, so my name is Aisha Sheikh, and I am a professor in psychology, obviously. I'm a clinical psychologist, and um, so I think that when most people think about psychology, they are actually thinking about clinical psychology or counseling psychology, and those are sort of my areas of specialization and my areas of interest. Um, so very popular with our students um, in terms of what they're often interested in. So I'm working, I work with people that have psychological problems that are struggling in their relationships with others um, that are dealing with the stresses and strains of the pandemic and everything else in between. Um, so my experience and training is um, about doing clinical work. And so I've worked in a variety of different kinds of mental health settings and um, I've decided to sort of bring that experience into the classroom to help students learn about that and learn about how, if they would like to pursue a field um, in psychology that relates to the helping professions, I'm sort of all about that. Um, and I can tell you more about that and talk about differences in, in the field and so forth. So um, my background and experiences as a clinical psychologist, I'm a licensed mental health professional. So I, you know, I'm a licensed psychologist. Um, but I love to teach. And so that's what really brings me to Whittier College. And I like working with undergraduate students in particular. So um, one of the classes I really love teaching that I'll talk about a little bit later is a course called Clinical Communication, where I sort of help students learn helping skills. And so even at the undergraduate level, the students are getting experience practicing how to become a professional therapist. Um, so we'll talk a little bit later about what that takes to um, become a professional therapist, but they do get some experience in that in my classes. Um, I also teach uh, abnormal psychology, um, which kind of covers all the different treatments of all the different types of psychological problems. And um, it also helps us understand what might be going on with people beyond just a label. Um, and I teach courses in gender studies. Um, I teach courses looking at uh, the psychology of gender. Um, I also teach a fieldwork course um, where uh, students get experience um, actually doing internships in their areas of interest. Um, again, at the undergraduate level, that's really unique. And I love giving students that kind of hand-on experience to help them decide if this is a field that they're really um, interested in pursuing because it does take kind of a lot of education beyond um, just the undergraduate degree to become a professional psychologist and um, to get licensed. So want to give students those experiences early on to help them make those choices and make them competitive for graduate programs. Um, and I teach our capstone course um, and we focus actually a lot on careers in our capstone course as well as um, helping students really understand more about what their interests are and, and sort of get ready to launch um, for the next thing that they might want to do once they leave us. So those are some of the things that I, I do. Um, I've been teaching at the college for 20 years. Um, so I'm not new <laughs> to Whittier College. Chuck has been here a lot longer than me, and I'm sure he'll talk about that as well. Um, but I've been around for a long time. I'm, you know, Love the college, think it's a great um, place to come and learn. Would love for my daughter um, to, to come here one day. She's not quite old enough to do that, but I'm hoping that she will also become a Whittier poet um, one day soon. So it's a place that I hold really near and dear to my heart. My husband is an alum of the college. Um, he's got all of his family, his grandfather, his mother, his sister, um, everybody's sort of uh, Whittier family. Um, so we're really committed to the experience and love the small class sizes here and the close interactions that we get to have with our students. So um, that's a little bit about me. And I'll let Chuck introduce himself. Okay, I'm Chuck Hill. I'm a social psychologist. So that there are other fields of psychology where people can do research, they can teach, uh, that doesn't involve therapy. Although my research is certainly relevant to therapy, 
I do research on intimate relationships, on uh, dating and marriage. I've done a cross-cultural uh, study that was online in 20 languages and comparing relationships around the world. And uh, I teach the also, so I teach a course in social psychology where I talk about those things. I also teach the introductory psychology course, which is the first course that, that people take. And I teach it not only as an introduction to psychology, but an introduction to college, because most of the students are freshmen, and an introduction to life as an adult, because you typically change more during that first semester of college, becoming an adult, finally being able to make more of your own decisions and, and uh, trying to figure out who you are and what you want to be. And so it's very much an introductory course in that regard. And then I also teach a course called Diverse Identities, because I was interested in how do people form various identities and how do they change their identities and how do they deal with identity issues and, and all the different kinds of identities people have and sometimes they face discrimination and how do they cope with the discrimination and sometimes there's intersections of identities that that both the gender of inter, interacts with race and ethnicity and other things so so that's a very very fun course to teach too and then i all of us uh offer a course called research practical and this is an opportunity to gain research experience. And the beauty of this, this course is that within it, uh, whichever way the, the professor teaches it, um, we encourage students to give presentations at, at uh, research conferences. So here as an undergrad, you're giving a presentation alongside graduate students and professors at this conference. And then when you're applying to graduate schools and, and they're trying to estimate, well, are you prepared for graduate study? Then you present this paper that you presented and show them you're already doing graduate level work. So that's that's what we want people to get, get involved, get engaged, give you the opportunities that are give you a, a head start and advantage when you apply to graduate school and be well prepared for whatever career you choose. And I should said she's been here 20 years. Well, this is my 41st year. I could have retired some time ago, but I have so much fun teaching and doing research and mentoring students that uh, that, that keeps me young. That keeps me going. Awesome. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? We have some questions prepared in case we need to um, you know, jumpstart the conversation, but certainly happy to open the floor to you and, and your questions. Your question is about um, clinical psychology, right? So um, the course that I was talking about, is that the one you're interested in? The one where I was talking about? Yeah. So that's a course that's actually an upper division course. It's not really a first year course. So the first course, and I think this is one of the questions that um, Edna was going to ask us is sort of what do students take and in what order, you know, the first course that students typically take is the one Chuck was talking about, which is introduction to psychology. Okay. Um, if you've already taken, you know, your AP test and gotten um, credit for introductory psychology or you've taken it previously, then um, you could jump into some other courses. But the course I was talking about is a 300 level course. So usually People don't take that until their junior year. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I usually limit my course to 18 students so that you have a really close, intimate um, connection um, with the other students in the class and me. And there's a reason for that in terms of what we actually do in the class, because you're paired up with other students where you're actually helping and you're practicing these helping skills. And so usually students have had um, some experience in our other courses um, that have gotten them ready to get to that level. Um, so, you know, students typically take that in their junior or senior year. And there's 18 students at a time that I usually see in that class. So we have nice small class sizes. You know, our biggest class is, is intro psych and that's capped at 40, I think, right? 
Um, well, right now it's 35. 35, okay. Yeah. So, um, so nice small classes. So we know our students, you know, we know them by name um, and we, we know about them and we know about their lives. So it's a nice small class. Okay. Well, wouldn't, Arsha, wouldn't you say that about half the students are interested in clinical or counseling and the other half are interested in all the other fields? Is that, would you say that's about right? I think it's probably closer to about 70%. Oh, okay. <laughs> based on what I'm seeing currently in our capstone courses, but maybe yeah. those just happen to be the ones that take my capstone that end up doing that. But it, it's, there's a wide range of fields within that. So Maya was asking about, you know, neurodivergent populations, right? So there are a number of students, and this has become very popular, um, you know, that are interested in going on and becoming ABA certified therapists and working specifically with folks on the autism spectrum. Um, and so, you know, that's still within the field. Um, it's not exactly clinical psychology. It's, it's um, a field, though, a subfield and a subdiscipline. So if I include all of that and I think about the broad counseling careers that some of our students also enter, I'd say about 70% now um, are going into these kind of helping um, fields. And so a lot of them do that. But there are some folks that do many other things, you know, that um, and they might find their way back to this at some point, um, a helping field or a research field or go into something altogether different. And we can talk about that. Your son is interested in ch uh, child life. Uh, well, we teach a course called child development. Uh, then it's followed by adolescent development. And uh, you have an opportunity to learn about that. Um, there also is a, a, a child development major uh, in another department, and they also offer courses. They're more oriented towards people who want to become teachers, um, whereas we're a little more oriented towards people more interested in, in research. But students often major in one and minor in the other in order to get the background that they want for their particular career goals? No, we are not the only two psychology professors. So <laughs> there are six um, professors in our department. Um, and so we're just here representing the department today. So we also have, um, there's a faculty member that's retiring that's in the developmental field who we're gonna be replacing. Um, we have a uh, neuropsychologist, um, who also specializes in forensic psychology. We have a health psychologist who's also um, a behavioral neuroscientist. Um, we have a, another social psychologist whose specialty is actually in kind of human sexuality. Um, is that everybody, Chuck? Am I forgetting anybody else? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. And then we have some, we have some part-time um, professors too in, in the department. And one of them is also um, in clinical psychology. Uh, one of our yeah, partners. yeah. And, and we work together with other departments on campus is the Department of, of Sociology and Anthropology and Social Work. So some students will take courses in social work. So the, the, if therapists will be working with people who are, are being seen by social workers as well. And oftentimes in therapy, you have a team of people, maybe a psychiatrist and a clinical uh, psychologist and a social worker working together to meet all the various needs that, that clients have. Awesome. I, I want to ask a question. It wasn't on our list, but it's sort of related, um, you know, kind of what's unique about studying psych at Whittier, but also, you know, Professor Hill, you mentioned um, students who take classes in, in other disciplines, right? And they end up working together or conducting research together. So can you talk about um, a little bit about Whittier scholars and psychology or what opportunities have students had at Whittier College of merging Okay. Other well, disciplines with psychology yeah. and, and what have they done with that? Yeah, well, we, we offer 25 majors at, at Whittier and you have to have a major. You can have a minor. You don't have to have a minor, um, but that allows you can also take courses in a field without doing a minor or a major in it. And uh, you're required to take uh, uh, 72 courses out of the, I mean, 72 credits out of the 120 have to be outside your major. So some of those are for meeting liberal education 
requirements, which are designed to give you breadth of background, but allows you a lot of flexibility to take whatever your interests are. And you'll work closely with, with a professor who will be your advisor to help you make those decisions. And at a place like Whittier, you're actually working with professors where at a very large school, <laughs> you might be advised by a staff person instead of professor. Um, you might take a, a huge class where where a professor might lecture once or twice a week, and then you meet with a graduate student for for another time a week. And then when, when it comes to <laughs> asking for letters of recommendation, well, at a school like that, uh, <laughs> Professors may not even know who you are, whereas at Witter, you 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 know us, we know you, and and ideally you've worked with us on research, so we can really give you a good recommendation. I'll just add in because uh, I think Edna's question was also about um, you know with your scholar students or students that have combined psychology with other fields, and we have um, you know many of our students first of all double major and just the kind of traditional yes. majors. They may double major in psychology as well as child development if they're interested in, you know, uh, working with children, for example. Um, we also have some students, you know, that per pursue the Whittier Scholars Program. Many of those students within psychology that do that tend to still do the traditional major, um, and they may be really developing and designing their liberal education courses in a more kind of specialized way. Um, there's a fair number of students that are interested in art therapy. Um, and so, you know, you can do that in a number of ways. You could do it through with your scholars program, or you can do it by double majoring in art and psychology, or, you know, majoring in psychology and minoring in art. Um, so we sort of work individually with the students to kind of tailor their educational needs to what their interests are. Um, and so one of the real advantages of coming to a small school is that we can do that. You know, we can actually work with you individually. And the faculty here are the ones that do the advising. So, um, you know, at the very beginning, you might get advised by our advising center um, where they kind of help you pick your first classes. But then as soon as you get onto campus, you're assigned um, an academic mentor. Um, and so, you know, both Chuck and I mentor every year and we um, meet with the students and talk about their interests and goals and help them make some of those decisions about how do you kind of tailor your educational experience to your own unique goals and your unique needs. Um, and so even if we don't offer a major that's called something like a lot of students are interested in criminology and we don't have a criminology major, there are plenty of courses that can prepare you for, um, for those fields. Um, and so a lot of students will major in psychology, they'll take the forensic psychology courses, they'll take some political science courses, they'll sort of build in um, their own program of study, if you will, whether it's through Whittier Scholars or just through um, what they do with those 72 credits outside the major that they um, have to take to graduate anyway. And so we want them to take things that are meaningful to them and that are gonna help them kind of bridge themselves to, to meet their educational goals. Awesome, thank you. Would you say Whittier is accommodating to neurodivergent students? Absolutely. We have a student accessibility office that works with the students and uh, then uh, works with the professors to make appropriate accommodations. Yeah, and I mean, we're used to working with students with a lot of different needs. I, I would say that you know, a, a good portion of uh, Whittier College students um, have some kind of accommodations, but for, for whether it's for learning needs or it's for mental health needs um, or other physical health needs um, and just access. And so we are really committed to kind of providing equal access. So we do have an office on campus that's dedicated to that. And the faculty will work closely with um, you know, that office to make sure that we're providing access um, to all students. And so there's, I think there's a fair number of students that um, fall within that spectrum, the neurodivergent spectrum, which is broad. It's um, that, you know, that can include autism, that can include ADHD. We have a lot of students um, that have accommodations for um, those particular needs. And so that's absolutely something that uh, Whittier works well with. And Absolutely. I think partly that small, small nature of our school and the small class sizes lends itself well to being able to tailor things to meet students' needs. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you for that. I, I, um, I, I have to reiterate all of that and just sort of, yes, um, our small campus, our small population really allows everybody, whether it's staff or faculty or, or even your classmates to really keep an eye out on things and, and watch out for each other. Um, and it's and it's really, really hard to be anonymous here and fall through the cracks. And there's just so much support in the form of tutoring, accommodations like the professors mentioned, um, and just overall wellness starting, starting this uh, year, I believe, um, um, uh, teletherapy is now available to all Whittier students. It's included in their tuition and they can access um, therapists online um, as needed, whether it's for a one-time session where they just need to sort of, they need help coping with something or whether they want to enlist in a whole series of, of sessions to, to work out a, a challenge or a problem. So there's a big, big, um, huge focus on, on general wellness here at Whittier. Wants us to talk more about tutoring. Um, well, awesome. well, we have the Center for Academic Success, Advising and Academic Success, which provides tutoring. And so uh, they set up tutoring sessions for particular courses where they know that a lot of students need help, but then they can also make accommodations for other students who need uh, tutoring as well. Yeah, so that's peer to peer tutoring. Um, and, you know, there's a center and they're supervised by professional staff and so forth. But, um, you know, those are, are their peers who have done well, you know, in their courses and who have kind of figured out how to navigate um, the challenges. And so they're there and that's included in, in your cost of tuition. There's no extra fee for that. Um, but I have to also say that, you know, when students are struggling in our classes, the professors are also there to support them. So, we don't just say, oh, just go get your tutoring um, from, from CAS. That might be something that in addition to that tutoring, um, you know, you may want to come in for additional support in a professor's office hours. And so um, we all have office hours every week and um, that's what they're there for. They're there to help support students um, or to help students just take themselves to the next level of learning. You know, there's only so much we can cover in a class in a particular topic and they may wanna know more about it. You know, we're here to help you learn more about it. And so, um, you know, whether you're struggling or whether you're, you're really just curious to learn more, um, we like to have conversations with students about these things. And so we're there to kind of help support students as well as the, the actual um, peer tutors that they have in the uh, Center for Advising and Academic Success. And, we actually just launched a new um, program. It's a quantitative success center, and um, we have a writing center on campus too. That's um, you know that where there's professional staff as well that are supporting um, the students. Great, thank you. Ooh, <laughs> deadlines. <laughs> there are deadlines. It's college, um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, you know, so I, I would say, um, you know, we we produce a syllabus at the beginning of the semester, so students sort of know what the deadlines are from the very beginning, and they can kind of help pace themselves in that Center for Advising and Academic Success. We also offer academic coaching, and so if some students have, you know, tend to struggle with that or tend to struggle with time management, I would say right off the bat, like, you should go get yourself an academic coach. Um, they're going to help you kind of plan out your your whole <laughs> week, you know, and figure out how are you going to get all of those things done that you need to get done because there's plenty of time to do it. It's about really managing your time effectively. Um, and so, you know, it's going to be if, if the student has academic accommodations, if there's um, a disability, for example, and they have accommodations, then that is noted on the accommodation and then the professor will work with the student to come up with, you know, contingent plans. But generally speaking, you know, we try to hold students to the deadlines, um, but we're human and we realize that the students are human and there's sometimes where you can't make the deadlines that, you know, my own policy, if you don't have accommodations, is that, you know, you can turn in your work late, but there is a penalty and, and I very clearly indicate what the penalty is in the syllabus for late work. If you get COVID, that doesn't apply, you know, like if there's some documented reason that your um, work is late, 
then we, we work something else out. And if students need an incomplete at the end of the semester because they haven't been able to complete their coursework, again, that's something that can be worked out on an individual basis. But generally speaking, you know, professors want uh, the students to learn some skills that are going to be really helpful to them in the real world, which includes making deadlines, you know, and meeting deadlines. And so we're going to push students to really try to, to do that, but we also will support them um, in that process. And so if there are some issues or things, challenges that are coming up, you know, we'll encourage them to, to get the resources from um, the student accessibility services and those accommodations so that they can um, you know, get extended time for particular assignments, but we don't just willy nilly like say, nope, there's no deadlines and just turn everything in whenever you want, because we also usually have like a reason <laughs> that we have that deadline um, and that the work builds on itself. And so if you, um, you know, just throw all the deadlines out the window, then you're, you're not going to be prepared for the next thing that's coming and then it can kind of snowball. So we try to help students um, stick with those deadlines. And I think we, we make pretty reasonable deadlines for students um, and communicate way in advance, you know, when things will be due so students can plan for that. Well, one thing I emphasize in intro psych is time management. And the CAS provides a lot of support in helping students figure out how to do that, because that's a life skill for later on in a career. How are you going to juggle a career and family and all these responsibilities, learning how to manage your time, uh, but then allowing for accommodations when, when it's appropriate. Yeah, if, if, if you have a, a documented kind of um, disability, then you can ask for those accommodations. And you know, the way it works is, is gonna be different class by class um, and instructor by instructor, because like I said, sometimes those deadlines, ha things have to be done, you know? And so we can't just have it in, open-ended indefinite deadline we say okay you can have an additional week for this but this is going to push this other one back and then we need to kind of work out a plan for each student um, that will use that so again we we want to support the students in um in being able to be successful and i think we've done a really good job in psychology of helping students be successful um, with accommodations and even without accommodations um, to kind of meet their goals Walk us through, professors, walk us through what the four years would look like for <laughs> a psychology student. What classes are they going to take? What are they going to learn? And then what are they going to do with that after uh, they graduate? Afterward. Okay. Well, your freshman year, you would, you would take introductory psychology. Um, you would take a writing course because writing is an essential skill uh, in any profession. And uh, we want to make sure you have enough math background to be able to handle some of the courses that require math. And then you will start taking some of your other liberal education courses, which might be a cultures class where you learn about other cultures or, or, or could be other things. So you're, you're building up all these other courses that meet requirements. And then your sophomore year in psychology, you're going to take research methods and statistics because that will help you understand the research that's talked about in all the psychology courses. Then you're, and you will then take a couple of electives in various fields, uh, various areas of psychology. Your junior year, you'll take another methods course of your choice in one of the areas that you're interested in, along with some more elective classes. And then finally, your senior year, you're going to take that capstone course that I should mention, where you kind of pull all of this knowledge together in some kind of kind of a product. So along the way, you will have, have taken five elective courses in psychology in whatever areas you're interested in. And uh, as I said, the 72 credits out of the 120 are outside your major. About half of them are in liberal education courses, and then the other half are whatever you want, which might be a minor, 
could be a double major uh, or just courses that you're interested in, or maybe you want to explore something that you think you might be interested. Maybe you're not sure of your major and you want to take several courses. So there's lots of room in the curriculum for you to do those kinds of explorations. Thank you. Um, what are your favorite classes to teach? Well, um, all of them. Okay. But I mean, I, I really, I love teaching. Um, but I, I think that that clinical class I was talking about before where I'm actually helping students learn the counseling skills has got to be one of my favorites. And it's one that I brought to Whittier College. It was kind of new and it's very unique. I don't think this is offered at most other undergraduate institutions. Um, where students actually get that kind of experience. And that is that junior year um, that Chuck was talking about. He called it a methods course. So it's a laboratory course. It's a hands-on experiential course where you're going to be using some of the things you've learned along the way in terms of research methods and, um, and so forth. But for me, I really think that the cool thing about it is that it's experiential. It's not just that you are reading about something in a book, you're actually learning how to do it and doing it. Um, and so, you know, whether that, and there's different choices. So a lot of the students that are interested in actually going into fields like counseling or clinical psychology like to choose my lab course because they know that they're gonna actually get to do that in that course. There are some students that are interested in um, working with children, they may choose, there's a couple of different options, they may choose the, the psychology of learning course where they're going to, you know, learn a lot about principles of learning and they're going to actually develop a learning plan for learning something new themselves and, um, and so they, they get to do and enact actually what, the, what we're learning about in terms of theory and research and methods. Um, there's another professor that, that teaches a developmental research course where she's taking students over to Broad Oaks, which is a um, preschool through uh, middle school uh, education, um, and, and it's a lab school. And so the students there are sort of like our subjects in our research um, studies. And so we're able to go over and observe those students and see development and actually conduct a research project with real kids. Um, and so that's cool too. So the the laboratory courses are experiential. And I'd say that those are probably my favorite to teach, but we got to get students ready to do that. So they need all the, all the foundation beforehand. And you know, the other one I really like teaching is the abnormal psychology course. It deals with those things that Maya was talking about before in terms of diagnosis. You know, everybody wants to learn how to diagnose. As an undergraduate, you're not going to be able to diagnose other people. <laughs> um, you might want to, but you're not going to actually have the skills and qualification to do that. But you can at least learn about the diagnostic process and, and what that takes. Um, to actually make a diagnosis, you'll need the doctoral degree. <laughs> so there's going to be a little bit more education to, um, to get that, that place where you can make a diagnosis as a psychologist. And even Chuck can't diagnose people because he doesn't have the license to do that. So. Um, so there's some very spe specific things, but you'll get to learn all about it and see how it works um, and understand all of the different things. And I think students really enjoy that um, learning about, and they, you know, we, we learn about ourselves in that too, because everybody either knows somebody that's struggling with one of these things or might be struggling with them themselves. And so it, it really helps us understand people more um, in that class. And so I really enjoy that class as well. Chuck, how about you? What do you enjoy? What are your favorites? Well, I've, I've mentioned the three classes, the four classes that I teach. I, I enjoy all of them. That's why I keep teaching them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Great answer. Great answer, Chuck. I love it. What sort of math requirements are there for psych students at Whittier? I can speak to that. So um, for psychology, it depends on kind of your level of preparation. So you may be coming in actually um, having really solid skills in terms of algebra. And that's as much as you really have to get, like you have to have solid skills in, in algebra. And in my seventh grader is learning algebra. So I bet that you have them. It's a matter of, um, of really just making sure that you have enough <laughs> to do what the required course is in psychology, which is statistics. And that course is, is just gonna be, it's basic algebra and it's theory. It's about understanding how to apply that 
um, and, and knowing what kind of statistical texts to use, but it's really not a math course. The statistics course is not really a math course, but it is based on algebra. And so when students um, are accepted, they're gonna be asked to take a math placement test. Um, and I would say, take that seriously when you take it um, and take your time and don't just randomly answer the questions <laughs> because you only get to take it once. Um, and so if you perform well enough and you don't wanna, you don't wanna have somebody else take it for you because you wanna be able to do the work <laughs> yourself when you're in the classes. So if you don't have the skills, the algebra skills, um, if you're not ready yet to take our statistics course, which is the required course in our major, then you might be placed into either, it's called Math 74 or Math 76. Um, and so Math 74 is, is if you, you know, just bottomed out on that test, you, you, math is not your thing, you uh, ha struggled a lot, will help get you up to the level where you can start taking college level algebra. And then after college level algebra, you could take um, the statistics class. And so the most math classes any student would have to take is math 74, math 76, which is introduction to um, kind of tr transition to college math, then the college algebra course, and then the statistics course. But many students actually place directly into our statistics course. And again, I said that that's not a math course. We teach it in the psychology department. And so it requires math skills, but it will actually meet the liberal education requirement for your quantitative literacy. And so you may never have to take just a straight math class again if you place into um, our statistics course, but we wanna make sure you have the skills to be able to be successful in the statistics course, which is basically college level algebra. It's not even really college level algebra. It's, it's algebra. Um, I think, you know, if you can understand algebra and you can perform well on that test, you may just go straight into the statistics course. But like I said, most students, if they have to take another course, they're usually just taking the um, college algebra course, um, which is math 76. So maybe they take that in their first year by their sophomore year, then they can take the statistics course. So, so most, most students who major in humanities or or social sciences uh, end up only having you take one math class if they're at that that level. If they don't need to take 74 and 76, they only take one. Now, if you're in a course like physics, on the other hand, then you need to need to be able to do calculus. And so they would require more math. So it depends on the major. In psychology, we just require you to take statistics and be qualified to, to take it but other majors may require more math. Yeah, I was just talking specifically about psychology. So teaching styles, I think every college professor has a different teaching style, right? So some, um, some things about Whittier College to kind of note, and I think Chuck said this a little bit earlier and maybe Edna said it too, that you really can't hide here because we do have interactive classrooms. Um, and so, it's not just ever going to be just straight lecture where you never say a word in a class, <laughs> you know, like that's not what we do here. I had that experience when I attended um, UCLA as an undergraduate, but that is not what we do at Whittier College. It's much more interactive and engaged learning. So even if there is a lecture, it's not just straight lecture. There's a dialogue um, and there's usually time for small group discussion and large group discussion about those topics. So it's there's activities, there's um, projects um, that kind of frame classes. So it differs depending on the class and, um, and the particular professor, but um, it's never just lecture. Um, so it's, it's always going to be more engaged learning than that. We just launched this new Center for Quantitative Learning, and we have a really excellent person that's going to be leading that center. So I think there's going to be, you know, specific tutoring that's that's coming from a really informed perspective in terms of how to teach math differently <laughs> to different people that learn differently. Um, and so I think there's going to be a lot of support for um, students and, and there's also going to be support for the faculty in terms of helping them teach students and meet students where they are. Um, but it's just it's really in its infancy so I can't say too much about um, how it's going to work, but that's certainly the, the intention. And I just met the, um, the person that's gonna be directing that new center and she's excellent. So, and um, a previous math teacher in uh, the high school. 
Um, and so I think it's going to be really helpful for students to bridge between high school and, and college. And it's going to really help them meet those needs, especially right now when we're seeing there's a lot of gaps in learning because of the pandemic and um, shifts to online learning for, for some kids when they were in high school were, were difficult, particularly for things like math. For sure. Thank you. Um, any other questions that you, you'd like to throw in the chat or, or speak out? But um, I wonder if we can take some, you know, take a minute to review fellowships or the fellowship um, opportunities available at Whittier and if any of them are um, specific to psychology majors. So, I mean, there's a variety of different kinds of fellowships that, that students can get involved in. We don't have just psychology specific fellowships, but we certainly have psychology students that get involved in all sorts of um, fellowships. And a lot of those can be really self-designed. So there's, you know, opportunities for fellowships that are really pretty broad, and then people can kind of specialize in their particular field of interest or field of study. Right now, there's a peer health educator fellowship program that's really excellent. Um, this is the, the second semester that we've had that on our campus, and I have several psychology students that are involved in that, but it also draws from students that are in kinesiology, it draws from students that are in the health sciences um, as well, biology and so forth. So um, those students are getting a great um, entry into sort of peer counseling and um, helping students with the, that wellness that, um, that Edna was talking about before. And so that's a paid um, fellowship position and great experience for their resume. Uh, students also, many of my students also go into external um, internships and um, they are doing that sometimes just on a voluntary basis and some of them are, are doing it because it's a paid position as well. Um, that's really helping them again get the skills and develop the skills to get them to the next level and apply what they're learning in their classes. Something great about Whittier. I think one of the strengths of Whittier is its tremendous diversity. We have tremendous diversity of many kinds, racial, ethnic, and, and other kinds of diversity. And the beautiful thing about Whittier is that, that we can be successful with all these people with different kinds of needs. Whereas sometimes people will go to another school, particularly a big school, and get lost but people can be successful at Whittier. Yeah, I think we have really great, um, great programs to offer our students and offer a lot of support. Um, and you're not just a number here. Um, you know, we really do want our every, each and every student to be successful and to kind of reach their full potential and beyond what they even thought their full potential was. So I think this is really a place where you can strive for excellence and actually meet it. I think it's achievable. And I think you get to be, you know, a big fish in a small pond here. Every student has the ability to be a student leader on our campus. And, um, you know, students are very involved and can get great experiences. If you go to a giant school like I did, I went to UCLA, um, you never get involved in anything. It's, it's really just, you can get very lost very easily. And so this is, it's a great opportunity to, to really get involved and develop a lot of leadership skills and life skills and lifetime relationships. And I think that's something also that's really great about Whittier College is that you know we we care about the students and we form real relationships with them and you know I I'm going to be seeing some students that I haven't seen in about 17 years um, <laughs> this next week so you know they come back and visit us and this is their you know real meaningful relationships and meaningful connections the other thing I'll kind of add is that some people might not know you know about some of the things that are special about Whittier is. Um, you know, I teach uh, faculty led travel courses. Um, and so I'm going to be going to New Zealand in May with another faculty member in environmental science and the course is on environmental sustainability. That's not my area, but I'm going as a kind of second faculty member on this trip and going to learn a lot myself about environmental sustainability and, and I'm very interested in indigenous cultures. 
Um, and so I'm actually going to develop another course, a psych course in, in New Zealand while I'm there. And that's part of the reason I'm going. But the students get these great opportunities and every student has um, you know, the opportunity for a, a $2,000 scholarship towards um, a study abroad or travel study experience. And so that can, that makes this course, <laughs> these courses really accessible to um, our students and you get to travel to different countries. And, and I also do one a travel course that goes to Hawaii. So if students aren't wanting to travel internationally, they can still get that experience of traveling. Feels like you're in a different country the way we do it because we're not going to be tourists. We're going there actually to immerse ourselves in a culture and to learn from people from those cultural groups. So those are transformative experiences for our students. Like some of the best experiences our students can have and, and really it's very accessible. So most students um, take advantage of these opportunities, you know, while they're here. And so that's something really cool about Whittier yeah. as well. Thank I've, you. I've gone with a, with a, with a colleague uh, who, who uh, taught a course called uh, Managing Multinational Corporations. So I've gone with him to Mexico and to Argentina to interview the CEOs of corporations there to talk about how do you adapt to marketing and management in different cultures if you're if you're in an international corporation and that that was an amazing experience and and while we were in Argentina the CEOs told us that that our students ask better questions than other students from a graduate program did because our students were better prepared so <laughs> Yeah, those are really they fun. are they are Very I just fun. I just have to add, you know, something special and unique about Whittier is it it doesn't feel competitive. It, there's there isn't this cutthroat competitive culture here. Everyone really here. Everyone really is rooting for each other. And and students don't have to have everything figured out when they arrive on campus. Right. <laughs> there are certain institutions, certain schools where, you know, you, you you have to know what your major is and that's why you're going to that school and here students really have not just the freedom but the time and the support to figure things out and to change their mind um, as they go along so so that's something I wanted to to share excellent question um, you know Chuck mentioned we have a research practicum course where students can come in and, and work on research projects with faculty there are opportunities if you do like the Whittier Scholars Project to develop your own research project or a fellowship project to develop your own research project and research question and get support from a faculty member in pursuing that. But your question I think is actually bigger in terms of, you know, can you challenge the status quo? Absolutely. Um, and so we want to hear multiple perspectives and, you know, it's encouraged in my abnormal psychology class. It's not just about memorizing how we, how to, you diagnose a disorder. It's actually about challenging that and talking about what are some of the strengths and limitations of the way it's done? What are, you know, how is this functioning in society? What are the costs um, about doing things the way we're doing? You know, so absolutely, we are very interested in students engaging meaningfully with the work and bringing their own perspectives in as well. Um, and so that's not something that's going to be frowned upon that's going to be uh, encouraged uh, absolutely in your that actually sounds like the perfect fellowship project or the perfect capstone capstone project that'd be really cool yeah. um all right we have just about four minutes left in our in our um scheduled allotted time so any last question that that we can answer for you or um and if not professors uh any any final thoughts? I will, uh, there was a question that I, as I alluded to at the beginning about, um, you know, can you be a psychologist with a bachelor's degree? And I, you know, they, the answer to that is no, but you can get a really good start here. And so our students are very prepared to go on to the next step, um, whether that's to pursue a master's degree and work as a therapist or counselor, or whether they wanna become a psychologist, which requires a doctoral degree, our students are able to do that. We have very good success with our students gaining entry into those graduate programs. And because we're so small, 
we can write exceptional letters of recommendation for our students. And so they have gone to some of the best programs in the, in the country. And you go to a big school, you might get a, a graduate student actually writing your letter of recommendation rather than the professor writing it. And it does carry a lot of weight um, when you're talking about graduate admissions. So um, you can't become a psychologist with this, just a bachelor's degree. That's not just with your college specific, that's just the, the, what happens in this field is that you need more training and education. But we provide an excellent foundation and the students constantly are writing me back saying, especially about that clinical communication course I mentioned, I'm leaps and bounds. They're in their graduate program. I'm leaps and bounds ahead of everybody else. I'm already, I already came in knowing how to do what we learned in our first two years of graduate school. So, um, you know, I think you'll be well prepared to do that. Thank you. Whittier's offerings in cognitive psychology. Yeah, so one of our capstones is actually focused on cognitive psychology. Um, and so that is um, an area of, of interest for, for Joanne Hash, who is um, one of our colleagues in the department. So, um, and there's also cognitive behavioral approaches to therapy and, and that's something that's covered also in, in the courses that I teach. So we do offer courses in that. Great. Well, that's uh, that's about all the time we have. We have two minutes, but I think um, your answers were so thorough, professors. And thank you so much for for being so um, candid with everything. Um, thank you all for attending this evening. Hope that um, we were professors were able to answer all of your questions. And if not, um, get in touch with the Office of Admission. We'll put you in touch with them. Um, the conversation doesn't end here, right? So um, please stay in touch and uh, have a good evening.